Um, thank you, Brian. Um, I'm Phil Stinson uh, from the Classics Department, and uh, I'll be talking with you this morning about um, Rome Reborn. Uh, I think there will be some interesting parallels uh, between what I have to say and what has already been said this morning. Um, first of all, uh, I'll give you some background information about what is Rome Reborn. Um, have, who hasn't heard of the Rome Reborn project? A couple of you? Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, the Rome Reborn project uh, is uh, one of the largest digital humanities projects uh, in the United States to date. It's been ongoing since um, around 1997. Um, it began at, at UCLA. Um, it was, the project was housed there uh, and, be, and begun by the, the Cultural Virtual Reality Laboratory, um, which was in existence at UCLA from uh, 1997 until 2003. Uh, the project then moved to the University of Virginia, uh, along with the director of the project, uh, Bernard Frischer, whom some of you probably know as the former director of IAF at UVA. Um, this is a slide showing uh, the Rum Reborn model uh, in use at, UC at UCLA in, in probably around 1999. Um, in full disclosure, I have, I have the benefit of hindsight with this project because I was a graduate student at UCLA in the late 1990s, and I was one of the, um, one of the, uh, the worker bees uh, on the project. Um, during the period of its, of its uh, infancy. Um, I was a member, one of the original members of the Cultural Virtual Reality Lab. Um, at that point in my career, I was an architect, and I was, I was in transition from uh, the practice of architecture to uh, academia. Uh, nowadays, I usually uh, refer to myself as an archeologist, um, but uh, I'm a former architect. So the project was developed by the pioneering Cultural Virtual Reality Lab, um, and it's gone through a number of phases, and what I'd like to do is just review those, those uh, the, the basic background of the project, and then in part two of my talk, I will oh, give you an overview of the kinds of uh, knowledge that went into the making of Rome Reborn, um, the kinds of evidence that um, we use to build this massive model of, of the ancient city of Rome. And then the last part, in the last part of my talk, I'd like to um, share with you some thoughts and ideas I have about the relationship of virtual reality to knowledge representation, um, which I, I hope is a topic that um, uh, you all will be interested in, and I'm sure some of you will have some ideas uh, to share um, in this audience this morning. This is a, uh, uh, a view of the, the Google Earth Ancient Rome 3D uh, layer. Uh, this is the second phase of the project. Uh, in 2008, uh, the, uh, the Rome Reborn um, team collaborated with the Google Earth team, and uh, Google Earth unveiled a, a layer known as Ancient Rome 3D. Which, uh, which you can download um, if you're in Google Earth. The model uh, that, was, uh, uh, that is available in Google Earth is a, uh, a more schematic version of the original Rome Reborn model. Um, in order to function properly in Google Earth, um, it had to be um, uh, schematized somewhat. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it was a, uh, a fully functional version of the, uh, of the model, complete with lots and lots of metadata windows. Uh, here you see one uh, in the slide, and lots of, uh, lots of um, graphic icons on the screen um, to help the user uh, guide himself or herself through ancient Rome and uh, to learn um, uh, along the way. The latest, the latest phase of the project, uh, what 
uh, uh, Bernie Fisher calls Rome Reborn 2.0 is not available um, uh, on Google Earth. Um, he hopes to make it available eventually, but the model has just become so big, uh, it's too big for the internet at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I think they have around 650 million polygons in the model at this point. The Google Earth layer, I think, has around 3 million polygons, and at that, even at 3 million, they were probably way over what uh, Google Earth can handle. Let's just talk a little bit about the various products that the project has um, offered to the public over the years. Now the, the new homepage is the Rome Reborn homepage at UVA. There's also the Google Earth Ancient Rome 3D layer that I've mentioned. And then there are a couple of older websites, some of these I was involved with when I was at UCLA. The most important one is the Digital Roman Forum site at UCLA and the now defunct Cultural Virtual Reality Lab website at UCLA, which was last updated in 2003. When I go to the site, it, it, it seems like I'm looking at a historical document at, at this point, as some of you may know, in trying to maintain old websites you come into. It's just very, very difficult. There's a new center at UCLA known as the Experiential Technologies Center, or ETC, which is basically the, the new uh, cultural virtual reality lab. The URLs for these are, are in some cases quite long, but if you Google these keywords, you will get the URLs quickly. And if any of you would like to know more information about uh, how to access the sites, please please uh, send me an email or talk to me after, uh, after the talk. Institutional sponsors. Uh, originally, it was mainly UCLA. Now there are several, there are five main ones at UVA, UCLA, uh, and then at least one university in Italy, uh, the Politecnico in Milan, and then a couple of universities in France. There are many, many partnerships that have um, been uh, uh, created through the collaboration between the, uh, the academics, such as myself, who, who started the project, and uh, the members of the computer graphics industry. Um, Rome Reborn means different things to different people. That's, that's what I could say in short. There are lots of organizations that have contributed to it over the years, not only in academia, but in non-academic uh, non um, spheres. People, uh, Professor Bernie Frischer, at UVA has been the director of the project since the beginning. There have been a lot of collaborators. Diane Favreau at UCLA, the director of the ETC lab, being uh, one of the uh, major collaborators. And then lots and lots of model makers. Uh, now over 50 different model makers have been involved. Uh, most of them students, but uh, some of them professional model makers as well. And then a scientific committee. I now uh, I'm on the scientific committee. We have about 25 scholars from, uh, mainly from Europe nowadays, uh, just a few of us from the United States. How do we know what we know about ancient Rome? This is the second part of my, uh, my talk. I think it will be useful for you to, uh, to, to think about what kinds of knowledge went into making this model. Uh, first of all, we have the standing monuments themselves. Uh, this is the Pantheon in Rome, of course, the best preserved ancient Roman temple anywhere in the uh, ancient Roman world. We have quite a lot of, of monuments in the model which are, in, uh, are still standing today. Around 25 to 30 uh, of the models uh, have considerable physical remains today. Then, of course, we have the excavations. We have uh, the records of excavations uh, since the early 19th century to work with, and we incorporated uh, as much of the archaeological evidence into the models as possible. And in some cases, this has been an incredibly laborious task, which is very similar to the digitizing process that we've been uh, learning about um, already this morning. 
ancient documents, ancient maps, uh, historical sources, and other, other kinds of evidence. Believe it or not, we have uh, a very well-preserved, well, reasonably well-preserved ancient map of Rome. Uh, there may have been at least two or three maps of the city of Rome displayed in the city uh, starting from the early first century AD. But this particular map that I'm showing you, a fragment of here, was made around 200 AD. And we have about 1,500 fragments of that map, um, somewhere around 20% of the original map. Um, these maps have been crucial to helping reconstruct certain parts of the, of the city, especially the residential districts, for which we have very little archaeological evidence. Um, certain monuments, like the Colosseum here, shown uh, with a few fragments. Um, we didn't really need the map very much uh, uh, of the Colosseum, because it's still standing today. But for some of the other monuments that we don't have archaeological evidence for, even the tiniest fragment of them in the uh, ancient map uh, or maps uh, can be very, very useful. Then other maps of Rome that were made uh, in later periods, of course, during the Renaissance, um, as some of you may know, there were there were several important uh, new surveys made of the city of Rome, and uh, the makers of Rome Reborn have incorporated uh, information from from several of those maps into their uh, into the computer model. This is the Buffalini map, I believe, of the 1550s. Documentary drawings. Of, of the city, made by uh, artists and architects, uh, especially in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, often these, uh, these veduta uh, show ancient monuments uh, that, are, uh, that are no longer standing today. Here we have the Arch of Septimius Severus here on the left, which is still standing today. But there are uh, several cases where these documentary images that were created, um, hand-drawn sketches, uh, ink drawings and so forth, give us lots of information about monuments that are no longer around. We haven't been able to, to, um, to, to, to demonstrate that uh, wonderful sliding uh, graphic that you did, um, Stephen, with our uh, project, but that, that would be really fun to, uh, to attempt. <laughs> Ancient coins. Um, it, 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 this is uh, these these coins are are useful in some cases. Uh, here you see the Colosseum uh, represented in two coins on the uh, on the right, filled with uh, filled with spectators. Uh, in a few cases, uh, the coin the images of buildings on coins have been helpful in reconstructing the general appearance, although. Uh, the images on ancient coins are, are notoriously reliable when we can compare the image on the coin with, uh, with the real thing. But nevertheless, ancient coins have been uh, very important. Contemporary historical sources, there are over 50,000 inscriptions from, from uh, the ancient city found within the, the ancient city walls. A small percentage of those inscriptions are useful. Um, a small percentage of those inscriptions mention monuments and, and um, the topography of the city. Then we have the regionary catalogs uh, of buildings and landmarks. These catalogs were made in the 4th century AD, and they consist basically of lists of all buildings and landmarks in the various neighborhoods or regions uh, of the ancient city. The original purpose of uh, these catalogs is unclear, and um, the, the information recorded in these catalogs is not always very reliable, uh, but nevertheless, these catalogs have, uh, have, been, have provided quite a lot of information, especially about the parts of the ancient city of Rome for which we know very little from archaeological evidence, such as the residential districts, which I'll talk more about. And then, of course, ancient texts, classical texts by approximately 50 authors. Um, often, ancient authors mention places in the city. It's very uh, rare that uh, uh, detailed information is given about any particular monument. But nevertheless, the references to the ancient city 
in these texts are also incorporated into the model. Last but not least, the, the Plastico. Um, some of you who have been to Rome may have seen this great plaster model of the city of Rome, which is housed in the, Roman, uh, the Museum of Roman Civilization out at Aor. This was, this was commissioned by Mussolini in the 1930s, and it was begun then and, and not completed until the 1970s. Until the Rome Barn project came along in the 1990s, the Plastico was uh, simply our, our best reconstruction of the ancient city. A tremendous amount of research went into the making of this plaster model. And uh, Bernie Fisher often says that the Rome Reborn model is more or less a digital version of the Plastico. For the last part of my talk, I'd like to uh, uh, say a little bit about knowledge representation and virtual reality. Virtual reality, for some of you, might seem rather old-fashioned at, at this point in, in 2011. In the late 1990s, it was, uh, it was, it was cutting edge. And virtual reality has, I, I think, taken on a, a second life, or in second life. Uh, for those of you who participate in second life experiences, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so, uh, to some extent, the, uh, the Rome Reborn project from my point of view, anyway, is uh, is almost like a, um, a historical project uh, at this point. It relied on virtual reality uh, solely in the beginning, anyway, um, uh, as its vehicle for cognition and knowledge. Let's just um, talk a little bit about other kinds of representations of ancient Rome, just to give us some comparisons. Archaeologists make a lot of computer models nowadays of, of archaeological sites. It's become part of our, uh, uh, part of our routine. Uh, we, we build computer models all the time. We are constantly mapping. Uh, I have been involved in the mapping of quite a few sites in western Turkey. I use similar methods that uh, Steve Eckberg uh, used and the Atlanta Project uh, uh, is using. But three-dimensional computer models uh, for archaeology are, are very important. The Rome Reborn project is quite different than, say, this project, which is um, a, 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 a very, very complicated model of part of the Palatine Hill. Uh, the Palatine Hill, uh, as some of you may know, was the area where the emperors of ancient Rome lived. And we have the remains of a colossal palace on the Palatine Hill right in front of the Circus Maximus. And this particular kind of computer model only shows the archaeological evidence. There's no reconstruction whatsoever. So it's fundamentally different than Rome Reborn. All of the bright colors that you see in the plan and in the three-dimensional model there represent historical phases or other kinds of uh, information, changes in materials, um, changes in building construction, and there's very little reconstruction uh, in this model at all. There may be, there may be no reconstruction. So Rome Reborn is very different than this kind of, of representation of ancient Rome because Rome Reborn's fundamental um, raison d'etre was to reconstruct what the ancient city looked like. Then we have another kind of, of uh, knowledge representation becoming widespread in uh, the field of archaeology today, the laser scan. This is a, a laser scan or laser capture of the Pantheon that was done in uh, 2005 and 2006. Uh, made from billions and billions of, of laser points. Uh, this is just a two-dimensional section cut through the building, but it's a two-dimensional representation of a fully three-dimensional model of the Pantheon, um, showing what is there today, showing the physical remains. Uh, no, very little reconstruction is necessary, right, with the, with the Pantheon. So Rome Reborn is fundamentally different than these kinds of representations. It's also very different than 
say, a Hollywood representation of, of ancient Rome. Probably all of you have seen uh, Ridley Scott's masterpiece, Gladiator, uh, uh, in, uh, which was uh, released in 2000. Hollywood representations of ancient Rome um, uh, often are quite imaginary and, and uh, fantastical. Um, you might be thinking, well, no knowledge is required in, the, in, in this case, or very little knowledge was, was used in the making of uh, this model. That's not, that's not quite true, but um, the Rome Reborn model uh, is, is, is very different than uh, a Hollywood representation of, of, of ancient Rome. In terms of knowledge representation, I, 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 uh, in putting together this talk and in thinking about some research questions that I'm becoming more and more interested in, there are a couple of phases, I think, to knowledge representation with the Rome Reborn model. Um, the first phase in the beginning uh, was, a, uh, was the period when, when uh, virtual reality was the, was the main vehicle for uh, cognition and, um, and knowledge, uh, ideally knowledge. Um, this is a, uh, a photograph taken inside the special auditorium that was built at UCLA for the display of Romy Born and other um, virtual reality models created in this, uh, by the CVR lab. Um, this is a semi-spherical screen. Some of you may have, may or may be familiar with this kind of, of, of viewing space. I don't believe we have anything quite like this at UCLA. But uh, several universities around the country built uh, semi-spherical screens like this, or caves. Some of you may be familiar with the cave, um, uh, which was a, uh, a fully immersive, uh, a very, but very small theater for experiencing virtual reality models. This was very popular in the 1990s, not so much today, as, as uh, most of these um, computer modeling projects have have now moved to the internet as their primary means for um, dissemination. But in the beginning, uh, the project was, uh, the, the Rome Reborn model was, it could only be experienced in this environment at UCLA, powered by a silicon graphic supercomputer, you know, very, very expensive um, indeed. The software that we used was very, very expensive. Uh, a license cost around $20,000. You know, it was a very, very um, uh, expensive project in general in the very beginning. I don't know how we pulled it off because we didn't have any money <laughs> in those days. Um, lately, uh, Bernie Frischer has, has been fortunate to um, have uh, uh, been given funding from the Mellon Foundation and I think the NEH, but um, in the early days we, we relied on UCLA and private donations. Anyway, to experience the model in, uh, in the early period of, of Rome Reborn, uh, often we would, as instructors, we would stand up in front of our audience and we would kind of act as tour guides. Um, the audience would be looking at the model on the screen, but there was very little metadata available to them. There were no pop-up windows. Um, and so it was the role of the uh, guide, as we used to uh, call this person, usually a professor or a student like myself, to, to provide um, all of the information to create that mental map, a complex mental map um, that um, resulted in learning um, and knowledge. Um, the model itself, the virtual reality experience of the model, um, provided, certainly provided cognition, um, but we uh, we, we, we realized early on in the creation of the, of the project that um, the model itself imparted very little knowledge of ancient Rome. Um, it provided a sense of scale of the buildings and the spaces, but students needed a lot more than the model itself to understand very much about ancient Rome. Um, and so we quickly incorporated metadata um, into the experience, but we, and we had to modify the, the infrastructure of the of this auditorium and, and, and the computer, um, it was very difficult. With Google Earth, uh, everything changed. Uh, users, uh, users didn't have to go to UCLA. Uh, they didn't have to um, 
uh, they didn't have to, uh, they didn't require, their experience no longer required a guide. Um, enough metadata windows were in, and pop-up windows um, and links to websites were incorporated into the Google Earth <coughs> layer that um, uh, users, at least ideally, could teach themselves about um, ancient Rome. Um, that was the idea, anyway, and uh, I think it was a noble one. It didn't, uh, in the end, it, I, I think the, the user's experience on the Google Earth uh, Ancient Rome layer um, uh, has not been, in general, very good. <laughs> Any of you have tried to use um, the Google Earth Ancient Rome layer, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's very, very clunky, um, and uh, the model is very, very big and rather cumbersome to navigate around. Um, but uh, in theory, anyway, the idea, I think, was an advance. One thing changed fundamentally, though, in, in the experience, and I think this affected the knowledge representation. Um, users began at, bir at a bird's eye point of view. Um, in the original uh, phase of the project uh, at UCLA, we always began at eye level with students. We always began in the form of Rome at eye level. Um, with Google Earth, they be, you, you begin at, 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 with the point of view of a bird, and so you have to fly down into um, into the city if you can if you can do that. It's very difficult, and so this this fundamentally changed, I think, the way knowledge was represented um, about ancient Rome. Let me just give you another example of that. This is the typical view you get as you're kind of flying in. You see these. Um, these little icons popping up. You can click on those, and then the metadata window will appear, um, or you can continue to go into the model. Um, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to get down to, um, to, to eye level. In the latest version of the project, um, uh, this continues to be the case. Uh, at the moment, the virtual reality experience is suspended for the project because it's just gotten so big. Um, there is a plan to, to uh, reactivate the virtual reality experience, perhaps with a video game engine, but that hasn't happened yet. The model has just gotten bigger and bigger. The, um, uh, the, 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 spot, the, the, the various parties involved now have filled in a lot of the gaps in the model. They've also improved, as you can see, the aesthetics. The lighting conditions are now uh, rather smooth. There are shadows, ray traced shadows, and so forth. In the original version of the model, we had to bake, so to speak, those shadows into the texture maps of the models, which is a very laborious pro process and didn't, didn't work very well. Uh, with new uh, technology, it's now much easier to uh, create this more photorealistic uh, representation. But the, the, the vantage point in the images that you see presented on the UVA site are usually now from, from, upper, uh, from an upper level. The eye level vantage point, I would like to argue, has, has, a, has a couple of advantages. Uh, first of all, as, as uh, you commented when you were talking about uh, New York City and looking at maps of New York City, when you are, when you are at when you were o over the top of a map, or in Rome Born, if you were at the bird's eye level, uh, uh, you, I think, uh, this is an idea that I'm working on, but I think you, you tend to perceive that you understand ancient Rome. You can control it, you can see the whole thing, and uh, when you are at eye level, when you are inside the model, your experience becomes more distracted as you try to navigate through the streets of Rome. Uh, and from, uh, this is something that I think could be, could be studied, perhaps, uh, with, with, with students. Um, but the, the eye-level eye vantage point, I think, is more conducive to asking questions about the ancient city. This is one of the most recent YouTube videos of Rome Reborn, the most recent version, and as you can see, the emphasis in the new project is, uh, is on these very grand and sweeping vistas of the ancient city, 
flying over uh, the various parts of the city. And eventually, these in these movies that uh, the project is releasing, eventually you come down into the city and you, uh, you experience a few of the well-known sites. Um, but uh, I would like to argue that the, the, the eye-level vantage point, um, uh, which is missing from this new version of Rome Reborn, should be restored in some way. Going back to the ancient uh, maps of Rome, there are some interesting parallels, I think. The image of the ancient city of Rome was displayed at least in two or maybe three places uh, to the public. And this is a, an artist's reconstruction of what one of these maps looked like on the wall inside one of the imperial forums. This was a public space, a place that People could come and go uh, in and out of this space. They could look up and see this incredibly dense, very detailed, and monumental representation of the ancient city. The purpose of these kinds of, of maps is under debate today by scholars. The original idea was that they were cadastral maps of, the, of, of ancient Rome that were used by the by Roman government to calculate taxes. Uh, but there are some new ideas, I think, that are very interesting. One of them. Uh, which I think is relevant for my talk, is that these images of Rome were, were displayed uh, more or less as a kind of pro imperial propaganda. Um, they were put up by emperors to impress passers-by with uh, the scale of ancient Rome and also with the, the power of the emperor to control um, not only the city of Rome, but the people of Rome and the entire known world at that point. And so the image of the ancient city of Rome uh, was, uh, was, was, was crucial to uh, um, uh, the, the kinds of, of imperial messages that um, were, were being put out. I think there's some interesting parallels there with the way uh, we experience Rome reborn in virtual reality. And that's the, that's the last point I'd like to make. I want to leave some room for, for questions if there are some, because I know we have a scheduled uh, break. Yes, yeah, so there's a yeah. break right now, and um, the next sessions start at 11. But if people want to ask questions, you, there'll still be time to grab coffee and a snack. So. We have a time for a few questions right now? Yes. So I, I'm impressed by the depth of the, and variety of the different sources that went into constructing maps. And I'm wondering about the, the possibility of linking um, the maps back out to the ancient texts. So, for example, if you were in a particular place that is, descri that is described or that, or that played a key role historically or something like yeah. that, um, when you were standing there, you could sort of get an excerpt from that or, 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 or something like that. Because it seems like that, that's a really interesting way for someone experiencing the space to to sort of be brought back into the, in, into the literature of the period as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, the, the metadata windows in, in Google do offer some links to the most important texts for some of the monuments. Um, and then uh, the Digital Roman Forum website is really great with this. You can, you, can, you can scan over the forum, click on monuments, and pull up all kinds of information. Um, uh, the, the, the latest version of the model doesn't offer that, but I, they, they do want to do that. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah I, excuse me. I'd like to ask you about the, the, the technological framework that goes behind this. You, you, you indicated that this has been through a number of iterations. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, I, can you speak to the challenges of, of, of the need to constantly or continually reinvent the project as the technologies change and give you abilities to do other things? Unlike, you know, unlike book books, once it's published, it's published. You can always come out with a second edition. There, there's, a, there's almost a, a need here to constantly reinvent or update, isn't there? Yes, there, there is. And uh, the, the, the original model was, was in a, um, uh, a format called Multigen, which is a virtual reality modeling format, um, which is used in flight simulations. Um, and it, it was like that until about uh, 2007. 
things in that format solely. And then uh, it, was, it was converted to um, at least two other formats. SketchUp, Google SketchUp, that was the first thing that Google did was they converted the entire virtual reality model to Google SketchUp so that then they could bring it into Google Earth. Um, it's also now in 3D Studio Max. It's, it's in um, at least one more format. And uh, the, yes, the, this, is, this is a huge, huge problem. Uh, I, am, I am encouraging uh, the, the, the project to, to convert it back into a virtual reality format because from there we can, uh, we can do lots of interesting things with it. The reason that they, they have converted it to a uh, uh, 3D Studio Max format is so that they can um, add a lot more detail to the models, um, but they've sacrificed the virtual reality uh, functionality of it. But yes, this is a, this was this has always been a big problem. As the model gets bigger and bigger, it becomes it takes longer and longer, of course, to to convert it to another format. And we are the victims of uh, um, of of the economy as well. Uh, the original company, Multigen, went out of business. Um, they're now Paradigm or something else. So um, yeah, it's a it's a huge issue. More questions? Okay, well, I, okay. if there are any more questions, I'll encourage everyone to continue the conversations um, over in the snack area, and the next session begins at 11. Was it, oh, sorry, did I miss a question? Thank you very much.